because of voter fraud. Don't believe me? Hear what his former attorney general had to say about it. I warn those who watching that this contains strong language. No, just what I, I've been through, I've had, I had three discussions with the president that I can recall. One was on November 23rd, one was on December 1st, and one was on December 14th. And I've been, been through, through sort of the give and take of those discussions. And in that context, I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit. And... Uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it, and that's one of the reasons that when it Silence. And of course, above all, they lie about the reason that January 6th happened in the first place. And you know what it is. The entire country watched Joe Biden get what they claimed was 10 million more votes than Barack Obama himself got. Joe Biden got 10 million more votes than Barack Obama got. And a lot of those votes arrived after the election. In a lot of places, voting was Voting was stopped in the middle of the night. Why? In the biggest states in the country, voter ID was optional. Why is that okay? A lot of the protesters on January 6th were very upset about that. And they should have been. All of us should be. But the January 6th committee ignored all of that completely. Instead, on the basis of zero evidence, no evidence whatsoever, they blamed the entire riot on white supremacy. Here's Joe Biden. Bar on election day 2020, he was the attorney general of the United States, the top law enforcement official in the country, telling the president exactly what he thought about claims of a stolen election. Donald Trump had his days in court to challenge the results. He was within his rights to seek those judgment. In the United States, Law-abiding citizens have those tools for pursuing justice. He lost in the courts, just as he did at the ballot box. And in this country, that's the end of the line. But for Donald Trump, that was only the beginning of what became a sprawling, multi-step conspiracy aimed at overturning the presidential election, aimed at throwing out the votes of millions of Americans your votes, your voice in our democracy, and replacing the will of the American people with his will to remain in power after his term ended. Donald Trump was at the center of this conspiracy, and ultimately, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, spurred a mob of domestic enemies of the Constitution to march down the Capitol and subvert American democracy. He had been stolen from them. And whether all of their claims are true or not, that's a valid reason to be upset. But rather than reassure the rest of us that actually our democracy is sound, elections are fair and transparent, there's no cheating and we can prove it. Rather than do that, they call half the country names. And not just names, the worst name you can be called, a white supremacist. And then most bewilderingly of all, virtually no Republican in Washington pushed back against any of that. In fact, Lindsey Graham, violence worshiper to the end, said that his only regret was that the Capitol Police didn't shoot more Trump voters in the neck and kill them. You've got guns. Use them, Graham said. So here you have a sitting U.S. senator, a Republican, urging police officers to shoot unarmed Americans, many of whom were ushered into the Capitol building by law enforcement. How can people talk like that? For more than a year, they justified rhetoric like Lindsey Graham, shoot more, by claiming that January 6th was an insurrection. That's not a word they would use to describe, say, the months-long siege of a courthouse in Portland or the ongoing coordinated effort to intimidate Supreme Court justices at their homes with guns, a story they ignored today. But January 6th was different, they reminded us. It was unique because it was their offices and because it bothered Nancy Pelosi. So we should tell you, and as we said at the top, this is the only hour on American television that is not broadcasting unfiltered propaganda into the homes of unsuspecting viewers. On the screen, you see eight boxes. Those are eight different TV channels taking the Nancy Pelosi feed unfiltered. 
Now, if at any time in your life you've ever made fun of totalitarian regimes that, you know, broadcast lies into the homes of the population that they can't turn off, take a look at that. That's happening right now. Meanwhile, get uh, Trump's press secretary, Kayleigh McEnany. Sean Hannity wrote in part, key now, no more crazy people, no more stolen election talk. Yes, impeachment and 25th Amendment are real. Many people will quit. Ms. McEnany responded in part, love that, that's the playbook. The White House staff knew that President Trump was willing to entertain and use conspiracy theories to achieve his ends. They knew the president needed to be cut off from all of those who had encouraged him. They knew that President Donald Trump was too dangerous to be left alone. Proud of your boy! Proud of your boy! Proud of your boy! Yeah, just for awareness, be advised, there's probably about 300 uh, Proud Boys. They're marching eastbound in this uh, 400 block of um, kind of independence actually on the mall towards the United States Capitol. What happened to the pipe bomber at the RNC and the DNC? I mean, Tucker, the left likes to sanctimoniously lecture us that democracy die, uh, dies in darkness, which it does when you don't have the truth and facts, but also right. dies in duplicity. When the left is colluding with bureaucrats to silence. I am not allowed to say what's going to happen today because everyone's just going to have to watch for themselves. But it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. Who speaks our streets? Who speaks our streets? Who speaks our streets? And attack political opposition, but also duplicitous in the aspect of equal justice. And, and, and to me, this is a very dangerous place where we are as a nation, as Sean Davis just referred to. If you don't have rule of law, an equal application of justice, it throws everything into the absurd. And so. I hope Mike is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. Well, I think Kevin McCarthy and Republican leadership need to stand up tomorrow and say, we are going to continue this, and it is our solemn commitment to the American people that they will finally get to the truth and facts of what took place on January 6th. It's, it, no more lying. Declassify. Let's no start with the Kennedy assassination. Just declassify. Notice the, the two people they hate and want to kill? It's Assange and Ed Snowden. Why? Yeah. <laughs> give Ryan a warning. This is the out loud is here. We're going to give Ryan a warning. We're going to try to get compliance, but this is now effectively a riot. 49 hours declaring it a riot. We have to hold these re this Republican leadership accountable. It is their job to stand in, in the breach and defend their people from this type of overstep from the Democrats and the national security state. And if they well, fail to do that, they deserve to be primary. And that's exactly what I'm doing. 50 be advised, uh, Capitol Police 1 advised they're trying to breach and get to the Capitol. 50, I copy. We're about five minutes out. We're trying to make our way through all this. It's the Iraq war lady who told us their weapons of mass destruction. I believe you fought in that war. Um, lecturing us about honor and truth. How could that person claim to represent the voters of Wyoming? It's, a, it's absolutely absurd and insulting. She thinks that we can't go back and look at her record, that she's been lying to the American people oh. basically for her entire career and profiting off of it. But also she has to bring up this whole, oh, it, it must be a big Trump thing. No, it's not a Trump thing. There is right. the fact of the matter. The only reason that people were there on that day of January 6th is that the American people, a vast majority of them, did not feel like their voices were heard at the election box.
safety, we have a breach of the Capitol! Breach of the Capitol to the upper level! Advised, they're requesting additional resources on the east side as they've broken into that window and they're trying to kick it in. Heard at the election box, and therefore things started to get a little bit dicey. And if our ruling class won't go back and actually adjudicate it, what happened with our elections, our system is going to continue to decay. And no matter how much people in Congress lecture us, or Without objection, the chair declares the House in recess pursuant to Clause 12B of Rule 1. My kids didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. U.S. demands the truth. Or ignore these problems, our system will, will crumble until we get people in there, like I think we're going to have this November, that can actually say, hey, we hear you. We're going to go back. We're going to look at the election of 2020. Yeah. We're going to have a full committee. We're going to keep the January 6th committee going. We're going to disclose to the American people once and for all what actually happened. Release all the footage. Disclose the government's involvement. We have to start respecting our people once again. Everything that Liz Cheney just said, everything the woman that I'm running against... Everything they stand for, we have to cast that off if we are going to preserve this republic. That's exactly right. Oh, really? The senile guy got 10 million more votes than Barack Obama. Really? Tell us how that happened. Shut up. You're going to jail. That's not an adequate answer. <laughs> I wouldn't say. Joe Kent, thank you. What do you make? What do you make you of this? You've been following this since the day it happened. It culminates tonight. Your view. My view is it's important to keep in mind what the stakes are. The stakes are the repurposing and reconfiguration of the national security apparatus against the American people. Incidentally, the Department of Homeland Security has spearheaded this and amongst his other duties, Chairman Benny Thompson is none other than the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee in Congress as well. He's the DHS's stooge in Congress when the DHS is conducting the Patriot Purge that you've spoken of so well. <laughs> Housing members, they're all walking over now through the tunnels. And so there's a reason that people like us, when we talk about federal involvement in January 6, it's met with the most vicious and hostile response from the regime imaginable. But no matter how dark and uncomfortable these truths are, I need to support. I'm an investigative counsel for the select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. What do you want to call him? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacist and white like me to White supremacist and white proud boys. Stand back and stand by. 
uh, after he made this comment, Enrique Terrio, then chairman of the Proud Boys, said on Parler, standing by, sir. Was pretty much begging them to take the, tr to take the guard and that they kept refusing in spite of all of your efforts to reach out and convince them the threat was real. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right, Sean. And the Defense Department can only do so much because we're limited by the law, and rightfully so. The Defense Department is not allowed to unilaterally deploy American soldiers domestically without a presidential authorization for National Guard and without a legal request from Nancy Pelosi, um, the Capitol Police, and Mayor Bowser. And as you succinctly described in your outline correctly, which most Americans don't understand that legal process, we did as much as we could proactively and preemptively to go there within the confines of law and ask them, hey, we have authorizations, do you need them? During our investigation, we learned that this comment during the presidential debate actually led to an increase in membership from the Proud Boys. Would you say that Proud Boys numbers increased after the stand back, stand by comment? Exponentially. I'd say tripled probably, with the potential for a lot more eventually. And did you ever st sell any stand back and stand by merchandise? Uh, one of the vendors on my page actually beat me to it, but I wish I would have I wish I would have made a stand back stand by shirt. On December 19th, President Trump tweeted about the January 6th rally and told attendees, be there, will be wild. Many of the witnesses that we interviewed were inspired by the president's call and came to D.C. for January 6th. They repeatedly refused our authorization request. They repeatedly told us, we don't have anything that shows us there's going to be an attack. And on top of that, as John Solomon pointed out, they were more concerned about optics. You know, we at DOD do not concern ourselves with optics. January 6th. But the extremists, they took it a step further. They viewed this tweet as a call to arms. A day later, the Department of Justice describes how the Proud Boys created a chat called the Ministry of Self-Defense Leadership Chat. Uh, in this chat, the Proud Boys established a command structure in anticipation of coming back to D.C. on January 6th. The Department of Justice describes Mr. Tario coming into possession of a document called the 1776 Returns, which describes uh, individuals occupying key buildings around the United States Capitol. The Oath Keepers are another group that the committee investigated. You better get your ass to D.C., folks, this Saturday. Yeah, if you don't, there's, there'll be no more republic. But we're not going to let that happen. It's not even an if. It's, it's either President Trump is encouraged and, and bolstered and strengthened to do what he must do, or we wind up in a, in a bloody fight. We all know that. The fight's coming. The Oath Keepers began planning to block the peaceful transfer of power shortly after the November 3rd election. And according to the Department of Justice, Stuart Rhodes, the Oath Keepers' leader, said to his followers that we were not going to get through this without a civil war. Of uh, not just the Capitol grounds, but the men and women who are sworn to do their work there. And that's what we were trying to get them to notice. But unfortunately, uh, they wanted to politicize the January 6th, the lead up to January 6th, and also not put up any fencing or secure perimeter warnings on that date. It was a disastrous uh, lapse in security judgment by the folks at the top. And, and just a note, the sergeant at arms reports directly to Nancy Pelosi and Schumer. Those are the only people that could make a decision to refuse such a request. And the inspector general of the Department of Defense uh, in the Biden presidency examined your actions and basically said you did everything right, meaning Trump's Department of Defense. Isn't that correct? You're 100 percent right. It wasn't our inspector general. And we knew that was going to be the result. But that's not the result that the January 6th committee wanted to hear. I went before them and I actually submitted to the January 6th committee the entire DOD inspector general report from the Biden. In response to the December 19th, 2020 tweet by President Trump, the Oath Keepers focused on January 6th in Washington, D.C. In response to the tweet, one member, the president of the Florida chapter, put on social media, the president called us to the Capitol. He wants us to make it wild. The goal was for the Oath Keepers to be called to duty so that they could keep the president in power, although President Trump had just lost the election. The committee learned that the Oath Keepers set up quick reaction forces outside of the city in Virginia where they stored arms. The goal of these quick reaction forces was to be on standby just in case President Trump invoked the Insurrection Act. Did the Oath Keepers ever provide weapons to members? I'm going to decline to answer that on Fifth Amendment grounds for, for uh, and due process grounds. In footage obtained by the committee, we learned that on the night of January 5th, 
Enrique Tarrio, and Stuart Rhodes met in a parking garage in Washington, D.C. There's mutual respect there. I think we're, we're fighting the same fight, and I think that's what's important. They had not entered that into evidence. I had to do it. And I had to highlight for them the findings in that report, which stated the Department of Defense acted lawfully, appropriately, and without delay. That's the key that the American people need to understand. But what they need to educate themselves on even more is the depths of that report, which showed the failures of the political leadership to take us up on those requests so that we could safeguard the Capitol. They wouldn't even allow a no fence, a no climb fence to be established around the perimeter. You've seen these fences in D.C. all the time. It prevents scaling of our buildings and properties. They, again, went to optics and didn't want that look. That alone would have stopped anything on January 6th. I, I want to be very clear. When you testified before this committee, you told them all of this. When the Secretary of Defense, Chris Miller at the time, when he testified, the committee was told all of this. They have all of this information. Is that correct, Cash? It's 100 percent correct. The committee learned that the Oath Keepers went into the Capitol through the east doors in two stack formations. The DOJ alleges that one of the stacks went into the Capitol looking for Speaker Pelosi, although they never found her. As the attack was unfolding, Mr. Tario took credit. In documents obtained by the Department of Justice, Mr. Tario said in an encrypted chat, make no mistake, and we did this. Later on that evening, Mr. Tario even posted a video which seemed to resemble him in front of the Capitol with a black cape, and the title of the video was Premonition. The evidence developed by the Select Committee and the Department of Justice highlights how each group participated on the attack on the Capitol on January 6. In fact, the investigation revealed that it was individuals associated with the Proud Boys who instigated the initial breach at the Peace Circle at 12.53 p.m. It's 100% correct, and I've repeatedly asked them to release the transcripts instead of doing what they're doing tonight, which is offering out piecemeal, cut up testimony and clips to fit a political narrative, as you said. This is not how you run constitutional congressional oversight. I did it differently when I ran the Russiagate investigation. We put out the documentation in full. We put out all 60 transcripts. This committee has that ability, and Liz Cheney led off these hearings and specifically said, we are only going to give you partially what we have discovered. We're going to hold back the rest. That's not how you educate the American public on how to safeguard a capital. That's how you politicize national security. So they're trying to make the case that Donald Trump is responsible for what happened uh, after he gave his speech that day at the Capitol. Uh, can you explain to me how the guy that authorized 20,000 or up to 20,000 National Guard troops is responsible for a riot that he was clearly trying to bring? Within 10 minutes, rioters had already filled the Lower West Plaza. By 2 o'clock, rioters had reached the doors on the west and the east plazas. And by 2.13, rioters had actually broken through the Senate wing door and gotten into the Capitol building. A series of breaches followed. At 2.25 p.m., rioters breached the east side doors to the rotunda. And then right after 2.40 p.m., rioters breached the east side doors near the Ways and Means Room. Once the rioters infiltrated the Capitol, they moved through the crypt, the rotunda, the hallways leading to the House chambers, and even inside the Senate chambers. Because I think anybody with common sense would recognize that if those troops were there at the Capitol, January 6th never happens. Take us back into the Oval Office on the 4th of January when the, there were the five of you, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, mm -hmm. and you all had that meeting when Trump authorized calling up the Guard. Yeah, so we were in the Oval Office talking about a very serious national security matter, which is why I remember it so distinctly. It was totally unrelated to January 6th. And then the president brought up January 6th and security protocol measures because they were on top of everyone's mind, given what was out there in the media. And the president said, 
you have my authorization as a commander in chief, you, the Department of Defense, up to 20,000 National Guards, men and women. And for us, who operate on the chain of command at the Department of Defense, we said, Roger that, sir. We will go get ready as best as the law allows us. But we did one step further. We went to the Capitol Police. We went to Nancy Pelosi and we said, do you want this troop request? Not even in a 20,000 format. Do you want it 1,000, 15,000, whatever number in between? They refused it all. Um, the crowd with orange hats, they came up chanting um, F-U-C-K Antifa, um, and they joined that group. And once they joined that group, Joseph Biggs' rhetoric turned to the Capitol Police. He started asking us questions like, You've, you didn't miss a paycheck during the pandemic. Um, mentioning stuff about our pay scale was mentioned. And you know, started turning the tables on us. And I've worked, I can you know, conservatively say probably hundreds of civil disturbance events. I know when I'm being turned into a villain and that's when I turned to my sergeant and I stated the, uh, the understatement of the century. I said, uh, Sarge, I think we're gonna need a few more people down here. Adequate election security, we need chain of custody on the ballots, we need signature verification, all of those key issues, uh, it was important to discuss that on the House floor. So the fact that it was not just Benny Thompson who objected in the past, but also Jamie Raskin objected to the uh, Electoral College counting in after President Trump's election, and he called for the impeachment of President Trump even prior to Trump's swearing in. So look at the Democrats on this committee. They have no basis. They are complete hypocrites. I agree with my colleague Jim Banks. And they want to avoid, again, focusing on the issues that matter to the American people. But I think the American people are smart. They are tuning this out. They see these individuals for hypocrites and Pelosi parrots that they are. All right, Congresswoman, thank you. Congressman Banks, thank you. Joining us now, the author of Saving Nine, that's Utah Senator Mike Lee. Uh, Senator, uh, you're one of the few people that I know that really cares about our Constitution. I give you a lot of credit. Uh, we did a reveal, it was revealed during these hearings that Jamie Raskin has an, another uh, motive in all of this. We started um, holding on, grabbing the bike racks. You know, there weren't many of us, so I grabbed um, the middle between two different bike racks. And, you know, I, I wasn't under any pretense that I could hold it for very long, but I just wanted to you know, make sure that we could get more people down and uh, get our CDU units time to, to answer the call. So we started grappling over the bike racks. Um, I felt the bike rack come on top of my head and I was pushed backwards and my foot caught the stair behind me and I, uh, my chin hit the handrail and then I, at that point I had blacked out, but my, um, the back of my head clipped the concrete stairs behind me. Uh, and you were knocked unconscious, is that right, Officer Edwards? Yes, ma'am. Democratic Party wants to throw it under the bus. They want to throw it under the bus with statements like that that he's making. They want to throw it under the bus by intimidating, denigrating, and demeaning the Supreme Court of the United States, and ultimately by packing the court so they can turn it into a political football. And Sean, the thing is, without the Supreme Court being an independent arbiter of what the law is, there is no constitution. They want to pack it so they can destroy the court, and in so doing, destroy the constitution. That's why I wrote Saving Nine. Saving Nine tells the story of the last time this happened, and the fact that we're still paying the price for it. When you look at, for example, just abolishing the Electoral College or packing the courts or statehood for D.C. or getting rid of the filibuster, all these items the Democrats have bought up, brought up, um, and your book really does highlight the importance of the Supreme Court, uh, when they do this, the Democrats have always wanted to do things 
that they can never get done at the ballot box or can never get done. Uh... All of the sudden, I see movement to the left of me. And I turned, and it was Officer Sicknick with his head in his hands. And he was ghostly pale, um, which I, I figured at that point that he had been sprayed. And I was um, concerned. My uh, you know, cop, cop alarm bells went off. Um, because if you get sprayed with pepper spray, you're going to turn red. He turned um, just about as pale as this sheet of paper. And so I looked back to see what had hit him, what had happened, and that's when I got sprayed in the eyes as well. Um, I was taken to be decontaminated by another officer, um, but we didn't get the chance because we were then tear gassed. Uh, and we... Um are going to play just a, a brief clip of, of that moment that you've just described, Officer Edwards. Yes, yes, you would. And you would especially be committing a crime if you were going to the Supreme Court justices' homes to protest in front of them. And if you're the president of the United States who actively encourages people to do that. And yeah. for your press secretary, Jen Psaki, if you said, yes, I support this, you'd be actively encouraging that. We right. know he encourages it. And we know, therefore, that he is trying to pack the court. We've got to stop him now. And that's why I encourage people to read Saving Nine. It'll give them the tools necessary to confront well, this, but we great... need as many people as possible to read it so that they're ready to respond. We need the help of all Americans on this issue. I, what I saw was just a, a war scene. It, it was something like I'd seen out of the movies. I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. There were officers on the ground, um, you know, they were bleeding, they were throwing up, they were, you know, they had, uh, I mean, I saw friends with blood all over their faces. I was slipping in people's blood. Um, you know, I, I was catching people as they fell. I, you know, I was, it was carnage, it was chaos. I can't, e I can't even describe what I saw. I, never in my wildest dreams did I think that as a police officer, as a law enforcement officer, I would find myself in the middle of a battle. You know, I, I'm, I'm trained to detain, you know, a couple of subjects and, and handle, you know, handle a crowd, but I, I'm, I'm not combat trained. And that day, it was just hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat, hours of dealing with things that were way beyond any, any a law enforcement officer has ever trained for. Um, I found this opening tonight so underwhelming. Uh, they had built this up to be, this is going to be the definitive moment where we prove that Donald Trump is responsible for the insurrection that took place. They didn't come close to even capturing my interest maybe for three minutes before I said this is a waste of time. How, how, yeah, how will the public measure, view this? Well, not well. Uh, there was also, I, I would argue, a measure of desperation here. Benny Thompson, the chairman, uh, trying to compare this to, to slavery in what smacked of blatant race baiting. Uh, but